I haven't finished this case history. I'm going to my next lot. I've got more on this. Um, oh, yes. So, so in this, in the, in this, um, this, this case history, we'll talk a bit more about then in, um, in the journal paper. So I looked at the journal paper. And um, this, is, this is a very nice read. And um, you, you planted very interesting contour plots of the retrogressive failure mechanism. As we, as also things we've seen here, and I don't think you actually say on the figures themselves, but I, I'm, I think I'm correct in thinking that all these contours are shear strain invariant, isn't it? Absolutely. They are contours of shear strain invariant. That's what you're plotting in these contour figures. The yeah, the shear strain. Yeah, the shear strain invariant here in your paper. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, so what I what I found rather surprising, I suppose, in a way, then, is that amongst all the interesting figures you've got, I couldn't actually find any figures um, showing the contours of stresses in your cell. So is there any particular reason why you left such a figure, you didn't include such a figure, showing the stresses? Uh, uh, actually, when I uh, ran this simulation, I haven't have a look at the stresses because uh, in the unitarity the stresses with the tensor yeah. and it's not I haven't figured out how to see the, the component of the stress. Right. Right. But after that I also after the paper is submitted I have a look on the stress to see whether yeah. they have the stress has oscillation or not. Yeah. And I found that there's a very significant stress oscillation. Yeah. As you can see on the figure 43. 43, yeah. yes. So you, so you have this figure at the end of your, at the end of your um, chapter, and you show yeah. contours of, it's contours of vertical stress, isn't it? Yes, with the sigma in the vertical direction. Vertical direction. OK. okay. Um, so in this figure, then, we should go in front of you myself. So on this figure, then, So on this figure, then, um, what, what, what units for stress do you have on this figure, first of all? So I think it's, uh, if I'm not wrong, it will be uh, APA. Kilopascals. Kilopascals. Wow. So your scale, then, goes from, so you've got a, so I think your slope is 17 meters high, isn't it? Okay. 16 meters. 16 meters, right. okay. So so your vertical stress should go between about zero and about 320, up to about 300 kilopascals of vertical yes. one. Okay. So if this is kilopascals then, yes. you are going from, you're, you're on your scale, 10,000, isn't it? Yes. It's from plus 10,000 to 10,000 minus. Yes. So, so huge oscillations. Yeah. And, um, Okay, and obviously there are, there are huge oscillations in the shear band, but there are other oscillations. You can see oscillations elsewhere as well because you can see the speckled colours appear. Um, so how how do you how do you think these these stress oscillations may have affected your, your results? Uh, I think it would not affect the results because the constant decoder I use here is not. A pressure dependent model. Mm -hmm. and, and for in this case, when I investigated, is that the stress oscillation will not affect the, the, the calculation because this oscillation, when we interpolate the stresses mm -hmm. from the particle to the grid, you will get the zero internal force. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like you have a particle with. Yeah. Like one ten thousand for the bus and one part is minus ten thousand and yeah. And if the bullet it will not be zero. Mm -hmm. So Okay, I mean I can I think I think you're right. I think I think despite the huge oscillations, I think because the model is quite quite a simple one, I suspect yeah. it won't have made a huge it might have made some difference of course to the softening rates, I guess, because I, I think I think I think to a, I think to a large extent because of the simplicity of the model, the, the impact will, will be 
smaller than one might imagine, seeing, seeing those seeing those express oscillations. So I think you I think you are probably correct correct about that. Um, okay, okay. But um, you, you do refer to the stress oscillations in your in your concluding chapter. Um, you, you say um, well, you refer to non-physical oscillations of the pressure and the velocity of the material point to observe when the solid mass reaches the steady state at the final deposition. But what about before the <coughs> before the final deposition? Uh, what I observe uh, that. As soon as when the particle is moving mm -hmm. to a new cell, yeah. you will start to have the oscillation. Yeah. So the thing is, in the steady state, I expect that the stress should be increasing linearly. It does mm -hmm. because it is physics. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it doesn't. So yeah. that is a very big problem. Yeah, I think it, I think it does start almost from the start. As soon as you start getting into your points crossing boundaries. Um, it, you, will, you will get significant oscillations, I think. And so dealing with these stress oscillations is very important, obviously, and this is, this is what you obviously can see in the other two chapters of the thesis, where you're looking at specific ways of, of improving the stability you know, of the, of the uh, solution, quite, quite, quite rightly so. So you looked at um, various ways of, of improving the solution. I, I, I don't think I'm particularly an expert on these myself, really, so um, I, I don't have quite as many questions on them. I, the material point method, there are lots of different, um, lots of different ways of um, or ways that people have looked at trying to improve the solution. Mm -hmm. And in your literature review at the beginning, you, you quite rightly reviewed all these various things. They've all got acronyms. Mm -hmm. You'll have a real job remembering all the different acronyms. There's so, there's so many of them. But in chapter four. Um, you, you use a generalized alpha integration scheme, uh, and and you mentioned this null space filter. And, and I must admit that before your thesis, I wasn't familiar with this with this with this idea of null space instability. And um, you, you showed some nice slides here in your, in your presentation, but maybe you could reiterate maybe what what is the main thing about null space instability? What is it due to? So. The thing is that normally we, uh, in the material point method, we need to uh, interpolate the data from the particle to the grid, and yeah. from the grid to the particle. Yeah. And in the linear algebra, we have the um, blue space in the mean that when you do the mapping method, yeah. we have a different dimension. Let's say if you have a system with one dimensional and you want to map the system with two dimensions, mm -hmm. there's a possibility that this mapping is not unique. Mm -hmm. So mean that um, we can got many solutions. And this solution, because the solution is not unique, you will have the noises. Okay. And this noise is uh, the Cost of the pressure oscillation because when we map from the grid to the particles, okay. we don't get the unique results. We okay. get noise. So, but is it, it's not, it's not, is it the only cause of these noises? Sure, there are other things as well. Was it, are, you, are you saying it all down to null, null space instability that you get this noise? Uh, I think it depends on the problem. Some problem in the new space, uh, there's you dominate. Yeah. Other other problems maybe the cell crossing will dominate. Yeah. So it really depends on which problem you're working on. Okay, and um, but this filter you've used seems to work very well for the examples that you you've uh, that, that you used if you want to, 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 to illustrate it. Um, and you but I mean one thing, I mean, a lot of, I mean, obviously, when, when you do this sort of thing, the first thing you to do, obviously, is to check it in Monday, um, and you and you've shown very nicely in one day about the conservation of energy and, and, and the accuracy of the results and the convergence and so on. Um, in two D, um, I think I think you I think you should some fairly simple two D pictures, but in, 
But how do you think it would perform for something like the, the slope you put down with your sand mix line painting? Do you think it would work? Do you think it would work as well for that? Uh, I think it would work well because the formulation I I developed is for the three dimensional uh, formulations. Right. So because I use the regular grid, mm -hmm. so basically it means that we I do three times one dimension in the simulations. Okay. Because each dimension I I do each other is not like unstructured. Uh, Therefore, uh, I am trying. I am. I am trying to implement my formulation in the green part, and I also want to see whether how it goes into the that okay. final. Okay, but you haven't. But you haven't attempted to look at a two D slope instability problem yet with this method, or with all, all the least squares method in the next chapter. Uh, for the two dimensional, I haven't do for that slide because the code I. I, I did this in MATLAB, sure. and the performance is also so very good for the slope of the movie. Well, the performance of MATLAB is not good for slope, for slope stability modeling in general, or? Because of the computation, computation the cost is very expensive. Okay. I expect like a few months to yeah. get the result. I, okay. I, 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 do. I, mean, what you, I mean, what you've done is very good. I mean, you've got some very nice results out. And um, I know it's very difficult, but I also know that going from one to two to is sometimes be pretty difficult as well. So yeah. it'd be interesting to see how, how they perform when you, when, when you go do that. Now, 